Hi everyone, welcome back. So I've had a number of different messages from people wanting to have a look inside my rig trays. So rather than turning it into a little bit of a freak show, you know, look at the crazy amount of rigs that um, this man's got tied up, I thought I'd much rather, you know, go into a little bit more detail of why I've got what I've tied up and why I have the kind of quantity of rigs that I have. So if we start off as a good sort of example, this is my tray of Gloucester floats. So I'm not one for really tying up specific rigs for like a specific venue or a specific event. Uh, I find that's quite sort of wasteful. Um, I'd much rather find a pattern of float that I really like, uh, is useful for a number of different things and tie up a whole tray full. So in here I've got everything from half a gram right the way up to four gram here. Now this tray of rigs is so universal, I'll sometimes use them on the Fenland drains, some of the deeper ones or when they've got an extra bit of flow, I'll, uh, I'll use them um, on a river for like my lighter kind of running through rigs. Um, I've used them on the Gloucester Canal as, as the name suggests, I've used them on the New Junction Canal. So rather than just tying up some rigs for an event, binning them off afterwards and not knowing when you're next going to use them, I'd much rather have you know, a good selection that I can take with me and use for a number of different applications. So, so what I have in this tray is I have eight half a gram ones tied up. I've got was that about six three quarter of a grams six. Um, one grams, six in a gram and a half, um, four or five at, um, at two gram. I think, well, why have I got so many repetitions of rigs? So first up, all the half gram rigs, they're all absolutely identical. And my kind of thinking of that is, if, if I go to a venue and I fish it, and let's say I find a half a gram rig is absolutely perfect, I want to be able to go there select the half gram rig, use it, put it back on the winder, and next time I go there, I can then use that half gram rig again. So if I'm going to a venue, it's not very often that I'll go just the once, it might be two, three, sort of four times, reasonably close together, um, and then I may well move on to um, somewhere else. So I want to be able to use that rig several times. The issue is, is if you go back to the venue, and let's say you've drawn a peg that's a little bit deeper, you can't reuse that rig or let's say you get there and this time you've got white water in front of you so you black out the tip to make it a lot easier to see well that rig's then no good for the return so what you'd end up doing if you fish like that is every time you get home you end up remaking that rig just to make sure it's it's ready again next time so instead because I've got plenty of spares of each rig each one identical if I go back to the venue and I can reuse that rig, great. If I can't reuse that rig, it doesn't matter because I've got spares. The way I see it, in making up a rig in the first place, the most difficult thing um, to decide is what line you're putting it on, what shotting it needs, even what rubbers need to go on the float. So using the half a gram again as the example, once I've made up one of those half gram rigs, I know exactly what it takes. It's very, very quick and easy just to quickly knock out five more, bang on the same. It doesn't have to be a massive chore to get a tray full of um, rigs up and sorted. It's, you, know, you can be quite efficient about it and uh, make it into like a sort of production line. A good example in reusing rigs would be um, the Angling Trust Winter League that I fish at um, Castle Ashby. So I may well fish six, seven or even eight matches there in quick succession and throughout that time I want to keep reusing the same rigs but every now and again I'll draw a peg that's a little bit deeper um, or I need a slightly different rig, you know, slightly different weighted rig uh, the baits change a little bit um, throughout the league as well. You, know, you end up using bigger baits at the start and smaller baits at the end. That then affects um, your rig choice. 
So what I end up doing is because I've got a big pool of rigs to choose from, I gradually change the rigs that I use um, throughout the league. And by the end of seven or eight matches, it's usually about 10 rigs that I've ended up using. And at the end of that league, I just remake those 10 rigs. So 10 rigs for seven matches, that's you know, quite, quite sort of rig efficient, really. I'd much rather do that rather than, you know, after every match going home and, and keep remaking them uh, all the time. It just means that I'm always prepared for what I've got in front of me. I can reuse rigs an awful lot and I've never got the worry that I'm going to run out of a specific rig. This may seem a strange thing to say for somebody who does have a colossal amount of rigs, but I don't actually have that much spare time to, to make up rigs and that much time between matches. So I'd much rather make my rigs up in mass like this. You know, if I have some spare days during the winter or, or some evenings um, spare, something like that. But then during the summer when I've got a lot on, a lot of fishing going on, I don't have time to keep remaking rigs. Um, between matches so by having a good pool of rigs it means I don't need to worry about it all the time I can put what spare time I have I can put all that effort into you know making sure my bait's correct that uh, all the rest of my gear is perfect I don't need to worry about rigs or, or even hook lengths or stuff like that because you know everything's all sort of tied up and ready to go and then when I do have a little bit of time to put into my kit, I can then go through, see what rigs have been used and, and remake them. So I can then replenish my stock. When it comes to organizing rigs, it can be very easy to find a rig that you've used and losing it in amongst your tray. So a good little tip that I've got, you'll notice in these tray here, my trays are not dead sort of neat and tidy you know the the idea is is to have a working tray of rigs that uh, these are tools for use they're not something you're going to take photos off and show off oh look at my fancy rig tray is just what's the point these are tools for use so you'll notice this tray is a little bit messy in that we've got some little bits of insulating tape on the tops of these rigs so basically this one here has got t4 plus one foot so that means that the rig on there I've used in a water that was a top four depth plus about another foot. So it was just about onto uh, the top five kit. So that means looking through my trays of rigs, I can say, well, if I come across that sort of depth of water, I know I can reuse that rig. And I know that one's been used. Whereas this one here has got a little slither of insulating tape over the top and it's just got 8.5 feet written on it. So that one I've obviously used in eight and a half feet of water. So when going through my rigs, I can have a look through and think, well, the reason I haven't remade that one is eight and a half foot of water for a one gram rig. That's quite likely to be reused. If I go somewhere and I come across that kind of scenario, I can get that, that rig straight out or even cut it down and, and use it in shallow water. If, however, I don't come across that, I've got five other one gram rigs all brand new and fresh so that's just the way i like to organize things and, and the way i like to do it what we've got here are my main two rig stacks so to keep it nice and simple this is my commercial stack this is my natural water stack so most of the time that will cover most of my commercial work most of the time that will cover most of my natural work However, if I'm going somewhere a little bit more specific or deeper venues that needs bigger and more specialist rigs, I do have separate trays that, I'll, um, that I've got in a separate stack that I'll carry with me. So first up, I'm not going to go massively into commercial rigs. I think there are no end of brilliant commercial anglers out there and they all talk about all their rigs and how they put them together. So uh, rather than duplicate things, basically I've just got uh, a top tray with these are basically all the rigs with one and a half mil hollow bristles. Uh, and here, I've just got a little area where I've got a few kind of used rigs. So, ooh, commercial rigs. The used ones, I'll just pop them in the top there. So they're nice and easy to identify. So uh, it's quite easy to do with those because they tend to be smaller. Uh, the next tray down, 
we've got some shallow rigs, we've got some pace rigs and some deeper water rigs. You can see the labels on them. And then in the bottom, we've just got rigs with a two millimeter hollow bristle. So I think that's gonna be a little bit of a clue for um, what's to come in that try not to make my rigs too kind of complicated. I think one of the most important things with float choice is the bristle diameter. So that's why I do have my um, trays labeled up uh, in relation to that. In my natural water stack, again, I've got a little bit of a messy area in the lid in that I do have a few kind of specialist rigs in there, a few venues that I do fish over and over and over again. So I'll just keep the rigs for those kind of specific venues in there. I've got a few different cut down rigs that are there. Uh, this here is my kind of go-to tray. That's a float made for me by uh, Mick Wilkinson. It's you know, basically a carbon stem and a um, fiber tip on it. It's just my go-to float for sort of shallow water roach fishing. Now these floats, I'll use them for bloodworm fishing, bread fishing, hemp, squat, pinky, all, all, all that kind of thing. And I've just got this tray very simply ordered. This side is all bulk and droppers. That side is all spread shotting. Although I do have an awful lot of rigs, they are really quite simple. Um, bulk and dropper rigs, I keep the bulks all the same kind of distance from the hook, which is generally around 15 inches. Um, that distance will increase with a heavier rig. Um, you know, rigs of a gram or less, the bulks all 15 inches from the hook. You know, um, if you're looking at like a gram and a half rig, it will creep up to about a foot and a half from the hook. Whereas you know, a real big rig like a four gram, it gets more to like two foot away from the hook. Um, when it comes to dropper arrangements, that's reasonably simple as well. If it's a small float, it'll have four number 12 droppers. Slightly bigger fl float will have three number 11 droppers. And then kind of after that, you know, bigger rigs of like a gram and a half, they'll have two or three number eight droppers. So it doesn't really matter to me what kind of float it is or what it's being used for. It's all relatively simple. Generally, the only other shotting pattern I use is spread shot. So I'm not a massive believer in tapered shotting or anything like that. Just generally, if it's a spread shot rig, all the shot are one inch apart, spread up the line. That's kind of it. And it doesn't matter whether I'm caster fishing, hemp fishing, um, fishing for F1s, fishing for carp, anything like that. Generally, I just feel that's a shotting pattern that really, really works for me. But the next tray, again, that is a little bit of a messy tray. That is like my, it's almost like a rig bin really. It's just got all sorts of rigs that have been butchered, used for different things and, and kind of labelled up. I always keep a few spare winders in here. You always get kind of caught out and sometimes we'll make up a specialist rig just for a particular venue and I want to hang on to it rather than put it back into my stack. So we've got a few bits and pieces in there. A few sort of whip rigs made up when I last went whip fishing on the river. And I've got a little area here at the back where quite often when you, you're putting rigs together on the bank on top kits, sometimes it's easier to do it on the bank behind your box rather than actually on your box. So in there I've got tipex for marking the depth, some nail clippers for cutting the line down, anything I need for altering and, and putting my rig together rather than actually doing it sat on my box. So it's just handy just to have those bits in there. And then the final tray that's very sort of similar kind of thing again in that we've just got some spread shot rigs, bulk and dropper rigs, but these tend to be you know slightly bigger, heavier floats with thicker tips um, for bigger fish. So whilst those two smaller stacks probably cover like 80% of my fishing and on shallower venues, just one of those stacks on their own covers it. I do have this great big beast full of all sorts of um, other kind of rigs. So let's have a little bit of a look through and see what I've got in here. As I mentioned, when looking at my um, commercial rig stack, bristle material and bristle diameter is something that's really important to me. So here we've got four kind of rigs here. 
which basically they're all derivatives of that first tray that I showed you right at the beginning, which is the Gloucester. So all these four trays here, they've all got um, carbon stems, they've all got a very kind of similar kind of flattened um, rugby ball um, body on them. So you could argue that just one of these trays of rigs will, will cover all sorts of fishing, but I believe feeding is the most important thing um, in fishing. So when you're going and practicing a venue and trying to work out how, how to fish a venue, it's the feeding really you want to be putting all of your effort into. That is what's going to win you a match. Once, however, you've got your feeding done and sorted, and you reckon you've got the, the venue sorted out, that's when you start tinkering with rigs and trying to get it right. So what we've got here is a tray of Gloucesters, which I showed you at the start. Then got almost a duplicate tray of Gloucesters here. They're just tied up on slightly thicker line, where if I'm fishing bigger reservoirs and stuff like that, catching lots of fish, I've got a slightly more durable rig. That's literally the only difference between these two. Next up though, we've got um, a couple of trays here, which have got a number of different Preston and Drennan floats. So again, they're quite similar, but what you've got here is, um, these have got like a one and a half mil um, hollow bristle on them. So they're a little bit more buoyant. You can fish slightly bigger baits with them. I've heard a number of different people say to me, keep it simple. The best anglers always keep it simple. Say, so, yeah, they do keep it simple, but you need to be using the right thing for the right job. And so just because I've got a number of different rigs with different bristle diameters, it doesn't mean that I'm confusing myself. Like this Gloucester tray, absolutely brilliant. That's kind of my go-to float. If I go to a venue, start fishing, and it becomes quite apparent that the bristle is too thin on it, you know, maybe you start striking at, at kind of nothing, maybe they keep dragging under. That's when I can then pick a float from this tray. I can either get up off my box, put one of these on instead, or when I next go back to the venue, make sure I'm using one of these from the start. You know, it, it's all about just fine tuning that final 10% and making sure everything is absolutely dead right. So using Thursden Reservoir as an example, it's a place that I've fished quite a lot over the years. Here I've got two different rigs that I've used there. Here we've got a three quarters of a gram Perfect Gloucester with a carbon stem version. And this is a 0.8 of a gram G-Tip 3. Generally, a 0.8 of a gram float at Thursden is absolutely perfect. That is the go-to float. However, when I first started fishing there sort of six or seven years ago, there was an awful lot of fish there. It was balling in ground bait by hand and the fish were feeding incredibly aggressively. So if you used a float like this, you spent half your day just kind of striking at nothing because it's almost like the fish were feeding so aggressively, they were creating like a vortex on the bottom that's just sucking your float under. So the thicker tips, G-Tip 3, was absolutely perfect for them. However, over the years, Thursden has got clearer and clearer and the way the fish feed has changed. So, it's now turned into more of a loose feed venue than a boarding it with ground bait venue. And you'll find if you fish a float like this with a slightly thicker tip, you're just not really kind of seeing the bites. You do need something that's a little bit more sensitive. So whilst this float was the perfect float to use five or six years ago, this is now the perfect float to use. So it's almost an identical rig. We've got the same line on it, the same dropper shot, they're both the same weight, they've got a similar body shape, they've got a similar carbon stem which I really like. The biggest difference with them is this Gloucester has the sensitive fibre tip, whereas this one has the one and a half mil, sorry, the 1.2 mil hollow tip. And just that very small difference absolutely sort of transforms your session. It is like that final 10%. If you don't get that right, that 10% on a match there could mean the difference between winning your section and coming sort of third or fourth. So it's why I think bristle diameter is massively important. Next up we have 
yet more Gloucesters, although this time these are actually a wire um, stemmed Gloucester with a hollow tip. Well, these have a, a one and a half mil hollow tip, so that's actually thicker tipped than any of the previous trays that I've just, shoot, that I've just showed you. Where I'd use these floats would be more kind of skimmer fishing, more where you're laying, more line on the deck and more, more sitting and waiting um, fishing. So whilst generally I prefer carbon, it means you have a smaller, less intrusive float. I think they fish quicker, they fish better. Wire does have its place and so that's why I've got this tray of rigs up. Just when I need that extra stability where I need the float to sit that little bit better for a little bit longer and because generally when I'm fishing in those sort of conditions um, it's probably going to be rougher, windier with more tow. That's why I've then chosen a slightly thicker tipped float to go with it as well. And after that I've got two trays of Census Morovo floats. Now these are a really good kind of generic float that you can use for all sorts of different things. They have an incredibly thick, heavy wire stem on them. Far, far thicker and heavy than what the, uh, the Gloucester has. They've also got a more rounded body. So when it's incredibly windy, there's a lot of tow, or you really want a float to hang on to, this is gonna be my choice. It's also good on uh, a river with a lot of extra water. It's got quite a bit of extra flow. The rounded body, the thicker wire stem, it just gives you a lot more to kind of um, hang on to. So where, I'd use these Gloucesters with the wire stem and the, and the hollow tip, um, more on a, a sort of still water. These, they're gonna be used in rougher conditions and also on rivers. They're also an inline float, which also makes them incredibly strong. And I've also put them on far thicker lines as well. So I'm quite happy picking out one of these rigs, you know, for decking line to catch quality roach, quality skimmers, but then I'm more than happy to then put a dirty great hook on it and, and fish a lobworm on, on one of these on a, on a river or a drain or so they're made up on big thick strong lines it's just a tray of floats that I can use for a number of different things. Now these final few trays this is where it starts becoming even more specialist so I'm going to quickly skip through these because it's not something that's massively important or, or gets used a huge amount. We've got a tray of real bolt down rigs that are sometimes used on the Fenland drains. The bolts are very close to the hook. They're very specialist just for that. They're coupled with some pencil floats, which occasionally gets used on the whip. Occasionally they might come out where there's a massive amount of fish in front of you, smaller fish, and you want a really heavy rig for the depth of water. So to compensate for the fact that the rig's so heavy, I can then use a slightly sort of thinner float to try and keep a little bit of sensitivity there. So that's basically what this tray is. After that, we've got some flat floats. So uh, these are a, a census pattern. I can't actually remember the name. Oh, it's a Powell or Powell or Pabble, I think, or uh, however the um, French uh, pronounce them. There is a fantastic all round flat float. We've got some real big, proper round bodied floats there, you know, in eight gram and, and 10 gram, which very, very rarely are they gonna be used. But I've also got a few of these little uh, Colmic flat floats as well, which they're a little bit more of a specialist flat float in that they're a completely straight tip and stem on them. So you can actually use them, you know, just when there's surface skim rather than on flowing water. So that's a little bit of a rare and specialist float that very rarely comes out. These final two trays here, I've got yet yeah, more flat floats. This is you know, more of a big fish flat float, whereas those are a more kind of roach and skimmery kind of flat floats, if, if that kind of makes sense. These are fishing real big baits and, and properly decking it. And the final tray, it's got some absolute beast flat floats in here. You can see they're all on winders. However, I've actually took the floats off the winders and I'm just laying them in loose there. So we've got some, that's 25 gram and that's 50 gram. I think the last time we used these was uh, on a census challenge match quite a, a number of years ago. So they don't get used very often and it's, uh, 
very, very specialist tray. Right, this might be hard to believe, but that isn't actually quite it. I do have yet even more trays of rigs upstairs, but they're all full of kind of older rigs that I don't use anymore, you know, stuff that I've made up, tried, used for a few years, and then changed my mind on. However, if it was all about the money, I'd just break those rigs down, I'd sell the trays, because I don't need them, I don't use them. However, it's funny in angling, the amount of times that things kind of come around. Um, in the past, I've had a certain type of float that I've used somewhere, and I've changed my mind on it, I don't use it, However, a number of years later, I've gone to a venue, started fishing and kind of realized that that kind of float that I no longer use would actually be perfect for it. And I've actually gone back, when I've gone home, dug through my trays, found a set of floats that were absolutely perfect for a venue that I was fishing. So for all the labor that goes into rigs, rather than just scrapping them and binning them off and, and having to retie them again, uh, you know, and you know, probably making a few quid selling the floats off, I'd much rather just have the trays sat there and if I do ever need them again, they're there and ready. So some of those rigs, they are getting on for 15 years old. So although I'd prefer a fresh rig, I don't think it really matters really. Like line, it doesn't really go off. You know, as long as the rigs have been kept in the dark, you know, the shot hasn't oxidized because, um, you know, that kind of white stuff you get on them because they've got wet. I'm just happy for them to sit there. I, I, I can't see the rigs deteriorating over time. So really, to sum up, fishing is such a personal thing and I think the paper the rigs people use and the way they organize their rigs it differs from person to person that's just the way i do it the way that i'm happy to do it yeah I'm, I'm pretty obsessive but the key take home message is feeding presentation you know the baits that you're using stuff like that that is 90 percent of the fishing the final 10 percent is tweaking your rig so put all your effort into feeding and presentation and stuff like that and then after that then tweak your rigs and, and try and get those right. So yes, I do have an awful lot of rigs. However, they're not complicated rigs. It's just very simple differences between them. I use a lot of the same lines, the same shotting patterns. Everything's very, very similar in that way. I just make sure I've got plenty of repetitions of the particular rigs. And for me, it's I put a lot of effort into fine tuning the bristle for exactly the venue that I'm fishing, You know, just to try and get that final 10% that may result in a match win. So thanks very much for watching. This has been quite a long video, a little bit of a detailed video. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has been watching these video, this series of videos that I've been doing, which I'm surprised actually how popular they've been, considering they're all me sat at home or in my garden and there isn't even any fish being caught. But uh, you know, thanks for all the fantastic feedback. If you've been enjoying them, please make sure you subscribe.